2 Samuel 21. And notice again with me, if you would, this morning. Why, I just noticed brother and sister Mabe. My eyes are getting bad. How you doing? Appreciate you bringing the sunshine back with you. Just got back from Florida. How many appreciate that warm weather? Amen. Thank you. Good to see you all in church today. Wow, that's great. Well, 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse number 15. If you just look at it one more time, some of you were ready to read when Brother Rogers read a minute ago, but maybe you weren't. So let's look at it. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. I want you to read the last four words with me. And David waxed faint. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God that you'd speak to each and every heart. And Father, sometimes we don't and can't see the faces. We don't know the hearts. But Father, only you can do, do that. Only you can make a difference. And we pray that you would today. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's, um, it's estimated that David here in verse number 15 is in his late 50s, maybe early 60s. The old gray mare just ain't what she used to be. If anybody understands that, say amen. You didn't say amen, dear. Amen. All right. How many, uh, someone gave this to me the day, how do you know when you're getting old? When everything hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. Amen. You know you're getting old. How do you know you're getting old? When you repeat everything. Number three, how do you know you're getting old? When you repeat everything. How do you know you're getting old? When the gleam in your eye is from the sun hitting your bifocals. (laughs) You know you're getting old. Amen. You know you're getting old when you sit in the rocking chair and you can't get it going. (laughs) Amen. Yeah. When everybody in your black book, their last name ends in M.D., you know you're getting old. Amen. Here it is. This is for you, Brother Markheim, Ms. Markheim. You know you're getting old when your children look middle-aged. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Um, you know you're getting old when you know all the answers, but nobody asks you the questions. Amen. Yeah. I like this one. You know you're getting old when the little gray-haired lady you help across the street is your wife. <laughs> you know you're getting old. Amen. Uh, (laughs) You know you're getting old uh, when your uh, knees buckle and your belt won't. Yeah. And here's my favorite. You know you're getting old when you turn out the light for economic reasons and not romantic reasons. Amen. (laughs) Come on, say amen. Yeah. But David said these words that he that about him that he waxed faint. You know, David's always been my hero. If there's any character in the Bible that I would say was my favorite character in all the Bible, it was David. Maybe I felt sometimes like I could just, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Associate with David. He, it's an amazing story. I love the story about the, uh, the time when he was out there watching his father's sheep and the lion and the bear came around. Amen? And uh, he, the Bible says that he tore them or... or took care of them with his bare hands. And we just kind of look over that today. But if you heard on the news today that someone fought a lion and won and someone fought a bear, I mean, this guy would be on every talk show. He would be a millionaire today. Amen. It just is is an impossibility. But God gave him the strength. Amen. Then that amazing day when the giant lost his mind. Amen. And uh, when David there as a young boy, his dad sent him and, and saw the battle, what was going on. He said those famous words, is there not a cause? And he stepped up and took that sling out of his pocket. The most amazing story, I believe, in all the Bible. And he slew the giant. And David had a great life and a lot of battles and a lot of victories. But something is going wrong here in verse 15. David was my hero, and I just don't understand it. I never thought I'd see the day when David waxed faint. I mean, you know, uh, David was weary. David got discouraged. He was overwhelmed. I mean, I I know I get overwhelmed, and I get exhausted in life, and, and I get discouraged in life. But David, the great hero in the Bible, you know, if I can say this morning, it happens to all of us. 
There's not one here today that's immune from discouragement. That's immune from a a weary and exhausted, maybe overwhelmed with the stress of life. Moreover, the Philistines, verse 15, yet had war against Israel with day and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines and David waxed faint. And verse 16, and Ishbi Banab, which was of the sons of the giant. Man, how do you, how, how do you like that name? How many like to, like your name, your kid Ishbi Banab? Sounds like some of the professional athletes today, you know, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Akeem Elijahwan. Uh, T.J. Hushmanzada. What was the one? Uh, Ocho Cinco, whatever that is. Amen. Yeah. And playing at center, starting at center for the Philistine Giants, 10 foot, 2 inches tall. Ish, ba, 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 na, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just an amazing fellow here. 10 foot, over 10 foot tall. I can just imagine all the little boys in, in Israel, if you could, this morning, and and uh, they wanted to be like David, the giant killer. Can you imagine growing up in that society day? Instead of playing cowboys and Indians, they played giants and Jews. I mean, that's what they played. Instead of playing cops and robbers, they played Philistines and Israelites. And I can just imagine a little boy wanting to grow up to be a giant killer. And Ishbi Benam, verse 16, which was of the sons of the giants, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels. Whew. Of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Man, he's got this sword, and on that sword, it's got David's name written on it. I mean, his whole plans in life, he's dedicated life. His one mission in life is to kill David. And, and the reason about that is, if you know the story, this is one of the giant sons. David, you killed my daddy. I, I'm going to get you. And, and I can see how it all happens. And here's... Here's David out here, and the battle's going on, and the fight's going on, and his men are there, and it's been a long day. And, and David says, listen, fellas, listen, I need to go back to the palace, and I'll meet you guys back there tonight for supper time, and we'll go over the strategy to, for tomorrow's war, and we'll get it all planned out. And, and so I'm going, and they say, your majesty, hold on a minute. Well, someone needs to go with you and protect you. No, no, it's fine. I'm just going to go over the hills here. I've got my camel parked over there, and, and right here's where all the real battle's going on. You stay here. It'll be fine. And and so David starts out, and he descends down the hills and the valleys there, and his knees are weak, and he, he's tired, and he's weary, and he's thinking in his mind, I, I can just picture David, Brother Kelly, thinking of that, that cool water, that, is, that, that, that Israelite Jewish uh, Jerusalem water that those three men went and got for him one time at the risk of their own lives, and he's thinking about that water, and he's walking down this hill, and up another hill, and up and down, and not, but all the time not realizing he's being watched. Someone is stalking him. And I can see him as he comes to his camel or his, the horse there that he's traveling back on. And he's got that, that water uh, sack there. And he gets that water and takes a big gulp of that fresh water. And behind him he hears, David. And the first thing he knows before he turns around, it's not one of his subjects because they would never call him that. They would have said, your majesty. And he hears again, David. And he knows that it's someone that's a little irritated, has got an attitude, and David turns around, and here he has, and there's this man with the sword. And here's this man out here with the sword, and it's gleaming in the noonday sun, and, and, and David's right, caught right in the middle, and there's nowhere to turn. And, and David says, yes. And the man says, hello, my name is Ishbi Banab. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> Amen. That's in the Bible somewhere in there. Amen. Yeah, that's a that's a Philistine accent, not a Spanish accent. You kill my father, prepare to die. And, and you talk about in trouble. You talk about in the between a rock and a hard place. You talk about anxiety and fear. And I mean, David's right. He's got him right where he wants it. August 26, 1990. George Herbert Walker Bush was president and at 11 o'clock p.m., he took a phone call, and he was trying to debate what to do with Saddam Hussein. I mean, Saddam Hussein, and, and people were telling him, don't go to war, go to war. And he had told him, he said, listen, now, if you go into Kuwait, you're, that's war. I mean, if you go into Kuwait, it's like declaring war on America. And, and, and so that's exactly what happened. Saddam Hussein took that as a 
challenge. And, of course, you remember the story years ago. He went into Kuwait there, and we were in war, and some people think, well, that's it, man. World War Three is on. It's over. I mean, Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon's here. This is the end of the time. But at 11 o'clock that night, he's on the phone with the best man in Britain. Hello, Mr. President. This is Margaret Thatcher. She was the best man in England. Yeah, yeah. They called her the Iron Lady of Britain. I just called to tell you, sir, that you have at all your disposal. I can't do a British accent if I tried, amen. The Royal Army. You have at all your disposal the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. We have 7,500 7, uh, uh, trained desert marines ready to go. And I just called to tell you, sir, that this is no time to go wobbly. Did I say that right? And I, and I was reading that this week, and, and it was a true story, and, and, and what was happening on the phone there, and I was reading that, and it got me excited. This is no time to go wobbly. And I looked that up in the American Oxford British Dictionary. It, wobbly means to vacillate from side to side. Wobbly means to weave or to bob. Listen to this. I like this. My favorite. To shake like jello. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. It's no time to go wobbly. And that's my whole sermon this morning. As I look at what we face in our lives today, and you can look across the landscape of the economy, even in the country that we live in today, and the Satan's attack on the homes, Brother Dan, and on the churches today, and what's going on in this world on Friday night. Was it Friday night? We saw this special, one-hour special on national television against churches just like this church right here. Picturing us, as some, honestly, as some cult. And I'm telling you, the day and age we live in, there's no wonder people feel fear and feel anxiety and the, the problems and the stress. This is no time to go wobbly. Amen. I want you to follow me today on the back of your bulletin. If you would like to fill in a couple of the, the uh, uh, lessons, you can have that tonight, today. Why, preacher? Why is it no time to go wobbly? Number one, because we must realize that spiritual war is real. I hope you listen. I hope you wake up today. This is not for for uh, uh, the, the, the uh, people that are not here. This is for us that's here today. Amen. Amen. Spiritual war is re- real. Just as we read this morning that David and Israel were in battles and going through this war. Listen to me. There is a spiritual battle. We all face it. Ephesians chapter number six. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But I heard Brother Rogers preaching that this morning in Sunday school class. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's all this order that's out here somewhere. All the rank and order against principalities and powers. That's superhuman powers. Yeah. Against uh, powers, against the, the rulers of darkness. Demonic influence against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's celestial places, heavenly places. I'm talking about there's a force out here that would like to destroy everything that's good and everything that's decent. Amen. And we think we can handle it and we think we're up against the, 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 we can take care of it, but it's a war. You would think that David, at 60 years of age, he had won wars, hadn't he? He had won battles. You would think he had fought enough battles and had enough victory that you would think that he was spear-proof. But none of us are spear-proof. Amen. Even though you're saved today, even though you've, been, you've grown in the Lord, I hope you have and been faithful to God and you've, you've grown in grace and you've grown in strength and you've grown in maturity. Listen, you'll always have opposition. There'll always be opposition. As a matter of fact, the greater the grace, the greater the Christian growth, Brother Kelly, the more the opposition. I want you to understand me today. There's people here, preacher, I got saved and you don't understand things. It's just, it's just terrible. Yeah, because Satan doesn't like that. And the more you go, well, preacher, I've been saved for 20 years. Listen, and he's still there. Yes, he is. Amen, Brother Lou? Yeah. Because the greater we grow and the, the greater we go for the Lord. There's a preacher, put it this way, new levels, new devils. And it's true in your life. You defeat one thing or you're, you're, you're good in one area. And here he comes again in another area. It doesn't matter if you're a Sunday school teacher for 20 years, if you've been married for 30 years. Hey, listen, if you've served in the church for 25 years, Satan can discourage all of us. I don't care if you're the preacher today, if you sing in the choir. Hey, all of us, uh, he can attack every single one of us. Amen. 
Satan wants to attack homes today. He wants, wants to attack your job and help you uh, get, lose your job and put you on where. You know why? Because then it's a struggle. And then you don't know where God is. And then you lose your faith. And then you say, just quit it all. I'm saying Satan wants to do that. And he wants to attack your physical body. And he wants to attack your emotional strength. Hey, and he wants to attack you psychologically and in all the relationships. For some of us, it's the giant of loneliness or the giant of grief or guilt. No matter what it is, I'm just saying none of us are immune from Satan's attack. There is a spiritual war and it's no time to go wobbly. God wants us to stand. I love that story. I've told it many times before. It's about this little place in Chicago. It's called Bug House Square. It's a place where people can get up on a town square and for 15 minutes tell anything they want to tell. Just if you want to talk about sports, you talk about it. You want to talk about politics, whatever. You want to talk about religion? Well, one day a guy got up there. He was an atheist, claimed he was an atheist. And he got up and said, I want everybody to know in, in, out here that there is no God, that God is dead. He's just a figment of your imagination. And a big, big crowd came around and people were listening to him. There was a young man that was going to school just right down the road. He had had football practice that day, a big defensive end, number 87. He had been in football practice. The day was over. He was walking home, still had his helmet, still had his shoulder pads on, still had his, his uniform. He was heading home, and he saw the crowd. And he hadn't by, and he heard the atheist, and he said, Hey, I'm giving God five minutes. If there's a God in heaven, I'll give you five minutes to knock me down. Prove that there's a God, then I'll believe you. And uh, the football player was coming by. He was a Christian young man. I tried to have a testimony at his public school. And he heard that. And the crowd was watching. He said, okay, God, I'll give you two more minutes. You're down to one minute. I'm down to 30 seconds. About that time, that football player put on his helmet. Amen. He snapped that chin strap. The crowd parted. That atheist didn't even know it was coming. He went through that crowd. I and mean, he tackled him. Forearm tackle hit him so hard. Knocked him to the ground. Knocked the breath out of him. He couldn't even get his breath. He stood over top of him. Finally, the guy came through. He says, hey. God was busy, so he sent me. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I, I'm just saying today, hey, I, I know it's a struggle, and I know all of us have it today, and we're all facing it, but it's no time to go wobbly. Stand for Jesus Christ. Amen. Why should we do that, number one? There's a spiritual war. It's real. Number two, Satan always what? Returns. Satan always returns. Look, if you would, with me at verse number 19. Chapter... Uh, uh, 21 verse 19. And it came to pass after this that there was again a what? A battle. Verse, ni- uh, verse 19. And there was again a what? A battle. Verse 20. And there was yet a what? A battle. I'm just saying the devil doesn't give up. You might win today, but he'll be back. You remember Jesus was there and was tempted for 40 days. You remember that story? Listen to this verse after he tempted Christ. Luke chapter Uh, Number four, and when the devil had ended all the temptation of Jesus, he departed for a season. What's that mean, preacher? That means he's going to come back again. Satan will come back if... If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm okay today. I'm not doing too bad. I don't know really whether the sermon's not for me. Hey, let me tell you, it's for all of us because you just hang around the corner. He's coming back to discourage you. He's coming back to knock you down. Amen. He is coming back. Number Three, there's no time to go wobbly because Satan is not impressed with our reputation. Satan is not impressed with our reputation. David didn't say, Hey, Ishbanam, Ishbanam, hey, buddy, look over here. You see that? You see that slingshot? You see that notch right there? That's for for your daddy. Yeah. Yeah. I fight like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. Come on, boy. Yeah. I don't know. I just make them up as I go. Amen. Hey, David, David was almost 60 years old. He wasn't out there challenging him like that. I, I know David had had some great victories. You read the Bible. Amazing stories what David had done. But here it says in verse 15 that he waxed faint. He was weary. Listen, Satan's not impressed with our reputation, what we've done in the past, who we are, who we think we are. Many people just uh, because they've had great victories in the past, they feel they're entitled to just their life will be fine from here on out. It's not like that. We can't live on yesterday's victories. You can't live on yesterday's accomplishments or yesterday's good works. 
Uh, thank God for them and praise God for them and cherish them. And that's good to have all those good memories. But listen, we need fresh oil for today. Hey, we need a new fire for today. We need strength for today to go forward. Hey, we need a, a new start with Christ each day. I'm saying, listen, Satan's not impressed with what you've done. Yeah. I was talking to a pre- preacher friend of mine and it's an amazing story. And, and he was raised. Uh, matter of fact, I talked about him a little last week, raised in an abusive home and Drugs and booze and fighting and screaming and arguing. Police coming to the house. Drugs and just a drop dead drunk. He said, "He said I was at 14 years of age. I was a drop dead drunk. Uh, knew nothing of the Bible. Lived in the ghetto all his life." He, he said that my house was next door to a beer joint, and that's where I worked. Where my, my father worked there. And he said, "But five blocks down the road was a Schwinn bicycle shop." Anybody know what Schwinn bicycle is? He said, I always loved going down there to the Swin Bicycle Shop, buddy. But they had a rule. They had a rule that kids could not go in unless parents were with them. And uh, I think that's a pretty good rule. He said, I'd go by there and see that my dad would never take me. I'd say, Dad, take me to the thing. And Dad was always drinking. He never in my life would take me to that bicycle shop. He said, I can't tell you, Brother Chuck, how many times I pleaded with my dad and asked him to take me. He said it. One day I was looking in the newspaper. I was six years of age. He said, I said, I couldn't believe it. Schwinn had come out with a brand new bicycle. It was a sports bike. It was on display. He said, it's going to be on display down at this store. He said, Dad, would you take me? 1965, they came out with a brand new uh, Stingray, I call it, bicycle with a 20-inch wheel on back, slick, 20-inch slick, a 11-inch white, white, white wall with a four-inch degree, I mean, a banana seat, a sissy bar. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I, the, the, the seat had, it was like kind of a, a flag on it, red, white, and blue thing. Just in 1965, just an amazing thing. He couldn't believe it. He wanted to go down and see that bike. So he went down. He was on his way to school, and he could just look in the window. He couldn't go in, put his nose up to the glass. He said, I always wanted that bike, never got it. He said, I grew up at 19, amazing story, 19 years of age, he, he was saved. Came to know the Lord. He said, I've been preaching. God called him into the ministry. He went to Bible college. He'd been preaching for over 31 years. He said, a few months ago, he said, preacher, I was holding a revival service and I was just exhausted. So I just was weary. Things weren't going too good. And I'd preached every day, Brother Luke, can you imagine, every day for, 30, for 31 days in a row. He said that last day I came in after that service and they had a motor home and fell on the bed. He said my wife literally had to take my clothes off me. I was just exhausted. He said I came to a place where I just didn't know if it was worth it, if I just wouldn't want to go on. God wasn't moving. It just wasn't. I was just discouraged. He said after the service the next night, he said a man from New Jersey came to him. He said, Preacher, I, I got something for you. I want to give you. God's told me to give it to you. And Preacher said, that's fine. He goes, after the service. And so they met after the service. And the guy said, now, preacher, I don't want you to laugh at me. I don't want you to think dumb of me. He said, but this is what I felt God's told me to give you. And the man said, that's fine. fine." They went to his van, pulled open the van doors, and there was this big box in there. They got the box out. They took a knife cutter and opened it up and folded it back. And out came that box, a brand new 1965 candy apple red Schwinn Stingray Bicycle. The man said, now listen, preacher, I know this is crazy, but I don't know why. But he, he said, uh, uh, you know, 20, 30-something years ago, he said, I was a little boy. My dad got me one of those. He bought me two of them. He bought me one for right. He said, son, keep this one in the box because someday it'll be a collector's item. He said, I don't know why that happened. He said, but, my, but God told me he wanted me to give this to you tonight. And that preacher started weeping. He went back in his mind and he said, oh, I know why God had you give me that. He said, God had that prepared for me when I wasn't even saved. I was a six-year-old boy. I knew nothing about God, but he had your dad buy two of them because he knows someday in the future there'd be a discouraged preacher out here that needed to know that God was in control of his life. I'm just saying today, listen to me, it's no time to go wobbly because God does care and he loves you and he'll be with you all the way. He will. Fourthly today, let me hurry. Satan is not intimidated with our spiritual routine. What do you mean by that, preacher? Satan is not intimidated with our spiritual routine. I'll never forget when God God called me to be a preacher. 
That's a scary thing when you're 19 years of age. That's a very scary thing. The reason it was so scary is because I had grown up in a preacher's home. Brother Kelly, I had seen the turmoil and I had seen the stress and I had seen the heartache and the poverty sometimes and I had seen that. I remember my dad preaching and I'd be sitting out here as a teenager listening to me as a young person and he'd be weeping and he'd be saying, I sure won't hope, pray one, but God calls one of my boys to be a preacher. I'd sit out there in the service and I'd duck down on the pew and I'd say, God, it ain't going to be me. Amen. <laughs> That's the last thing I'll ever do, I'll guarantee you. I wanted to be a wide receiver for the Cleveland Browns. Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> yeah. I wanted, if I couldn't do that, I was going to be an FBI agent. I always wanted to put someone in jail. I don't know. Yeah. I, I want to do something manly. Go in the Marines. I, want to do, I, I love the physical things. I want to do that things. But I, I told God I'd go one year to Bible college. Went to Bible college. There was, there was a man preaching one night. His name was Lee Robertson. I thought he was Moses. He, I did. He was just that kind of man. He would say things like this. Three to five, three to five. Just got to go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Be there. Don't miss. Three to five. I mean, that's just the way he was. He said, boys, listen, you got to read your Bible. Read your Bible. Don't quit. Just keep reading it. Read three chapters a day. You'll get through the Bible in a year. Stick with it. Just read it. He was preaching. I just never forget what God did for me that day. Not only did God call me to preach that night, but... That was the first night that I decided I was going to read through my Bible in a year. Three chapters a day. Anybody can do that, I thought. I started reading that Bible and I made some promises to God. But listen to me, that's been a wonderful thing. That's been over 30-something years ago. And I've read through my Bible many times. But listen to me, that has not stopped Satan's attack. You ought to read your Bible. That's where you get strength as a Christian. That's how you can make it. I can be here today. But let me tell you, it's not been an easy road. There have always been discouragement. It's always been a weary. And I have waxed faint many times, not because uh, he's intimidated with who I am and, and the routine that I got, that I get up and read my Bible and I pray and I walk with God. Hey, that doesn't stop Satan's attack. Can you imagine Ishbi Banab is there with the sword and there's David out there and he's, he's getting ready to take down David for killing his dad and David goes... Hey, do you remember Psalms 47, 46? God is my refuge and strength, a present help in time of trouble. He said, I wrote that. Do you know that, Ishbodah? I wrote that. Yeah, it went number one that year around the world. Yeah. I wrote for uh, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, I, wrote, I wrote Psalms 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And, and David said, you think, you think Ishbodah would have been impressed with that? Oh, well, okay, David, I won't kill you. Listen, the attack, it, it, we come, you ought to come to church. That's where we get strength to make it through the attack. That's where we get the victory from Jesus Christ. Amen. I, can't, I hear people all the time. Preacher, I just can't, be, I can't believe it was them. They, they, they fell. They got away from God. That, that was the best Christian I knew. And I see it in the last two years. I've seen family after family used to go to church and used to do this and used to serve God. And they're not even doing anything for God. And I wonder how it's happened because Satan is strong and his power and forces are so strong. And people have given up. Quit on God. Listen to me. If you're here today and you're saved and love the Lord, you know there's a bullseye on you. Yeah. I was reading a little cartoon the other day and it had two deer talking to each other. And one of the deer had this perfect bullseye right on the side of it. And the other deer said, wow, bummer of a birthmark. <laughs> You'd have to understand that if you're a hunter, amen? Yeah. And do you know that if you're a Christian, you have a bullseye on you? You say, well, preacher, I'm not struggling. It's not that bad. Hey, Satan ain't going to fight someone that's already on his side. Hey, you're not faithful to God and you don't try to put on the armor of God and you don't try to stand firm for God and do it. Hey, uh, uh, Satan's not going to fight you, but if you do stay firm to God and you do stand for God and you do love the Lord and serve God, the devil's going to say, let's get it on. Because we're not getting along. Amen. Yeah. This is no time to go wobbly. Lastly, this morning, number five. Here's the sermon. This is, t this is our time to step up. Isn't that good? Hey, it's our time. Are you still with me this morning? Go, go to verse number 17 and I'm finished. Verse 17. Here's the sermon. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. 
Boy, it doesn't give us a lot of information right there, but I like Abishai. I did a little research, Brother Kelly. This will get you. Abishai was the best swordsman in all of Israel. You know something else about Abishai? He was David's nephew. He was David's son's son. David's bro- brother's son. Can you imagine David has a... They're in the palace there. His family comes over for family reunion or for a holiday or just for a weekend to visit. And, and David's looking down the hallway and he sees Abishai down there with a little wood sword. And you hear him like, Abishai, he's just a little five, six year old, seven year old boy. Hey, I'm going to be a giant killer like David someday. Hey, don't kid yourself. That's the way boys would have thought back then. I'm gonna, and he's playing swords with that wood sword. And, and David comes over to, to his, his son and and he said, his brother and says, uh, hey, Bubba, they talked here, Billy, back then. Uh, he said, hey, hey Bubba, can, can, I, can I train Abishai in swordsmanship? Well, sure. Hey, Abishai, can I, can I, can I train you? Oh, yeah, Uncle David. And they get a couple of wood swords and they're going back and forth and he's training him in the art of that. Can you imagine as, a, as an adolescent being trained by King David? And as a teenager, he's being trained by King David. And then he gets some coaching from King David and all the way on. He becomes the greatest swordsman. Abishai, the greatest swordsman in all of Israel. I can imagine as Ishbibinab begins to come at David. They're there in the battle. You killed my father, prepared your day. And, and David is there and he pulls his sword out because he, he doesn't know what he's going to do and Ishbainab takes the first whack at him, and David tries to protect himself, but it cuts him a little bit. A little blood comes off of him. And, but in the background, you hear, Ishbainab! Ishbainab! And Ishbainab turns around, and there's Abishai, dynamite in a small package. And Abishai says, Command me, my majesty. And David says, Get him. <laughs> Get him, boy. And Abishai goes up, whoosh, 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 whoosh. That's in the Hebrew. Swish, swish. And he goes up and watch David. Remember that move you taught me? Swish, swish, swish. Bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah. Just like David several years ago, Abishai gets ahead in life. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. And there's no time to go wobbly. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, listen to me. For every young person in this room today, listen, every young lady in this room today, every Christian in this room today, do you realize that people are struggling? Do you realize that the devil is fighting in the lives of every one of us? Listen, I'm just saying today, hey, uh, there's somebody out here that is an Abishai that that we need to be standing strong for and and being uh, uh, accountable to because they're watching us and we need to be training them because someday they're going to stand up because it's their time to stand up for God. Amen. Charles Plum, during the Vietnam War, flew 75 successful missions off of the U.S. Kitty Hawk. On the 76th mission, he was shot down. He was Vietnam's equivalent of Eddie Rickenbacker there, the World War I flying ace. 76th mission, he was shot down. He was ejected out of his airplane and, and landed on the ground there, and they came and captured him and took him to the uh, Viet Cong prison camp. Uh, many of you heard of it. Uh, the Hanoi Hilton. You ever heard of that? For six years he lived there. For two of those years he was put into this bamboo cage. It was three foot square. For two years he never stood up. He was accosted uh, uh, with all kinds of torture and starvation and everything you can imagine. But miraculously later on he was rescued and After he was rescued, he went around America giving his testimony that Jesus Christ loved him and the grace of God that helped him make it through. It's an amazing man and amazing uh, things that he had to endure. And now it's 15 years later after that event. and He's in a city giving his testimony and him and his wife are eating lunch in a restaurant. And You ever have that feeling like someone's watching you? And he looks up and he feels like someone's watching him. His wife says, oh, you're, you're fine. And... But well, he looks over there and this guy's staring at him. And his wife says, oh, just go ahead and eat. That don't mean anything. And he looks up again the third time and he's not there anymore. He's right there. And the man's standing there and he looks at him and he's standing right in front of him and he says, 
Plum? I said, yes. He said, Charles Plum? 75 missions successful? 76 mission got caught, uh, ejected out of your plane and got captured? And uh, Charles Plum the, flew off the uh, U.S. Uh, SS Kitty Hawk? He said, yes, sir. He said, Charles Plum? He said, I want you to meet. And he saluted the man who packed your chute. Because when you pack a chute, you have to sign your name to that. He knew the man's name. It was the man who had packed his chute that day that successfully brought him down safely to the ground. Charles Plum stood up and, of course, embraced him. He said, every night for the past 15 years, he said, I've gone to bed and not one time have I failed to thank God for you and for the shoot that you packed and for God saving me. And Charles Plum went to bed that night. He said, Kathy went on to bed. That was his wife. He said that she went to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. He said, I remember back on that ship. He said, I was an officer. He said, enlisted men didn't have much to do with officer. We would salute them sometimes. But he said, as an officer, I had good quarters and I was taken care of. He said, but the, but the enlisted men had worked hard. He said, we were out in a, a, a junk, these areas that were so hot and so steamy and so filthy. And he said, that they worked down in the belly of that ship. And he would be down there folding these parachutes, intricate fold after intricate fold and all this hot and steam. And it wasn't a good life. and It was a hard thing. But he was uh, faithful to his calling. And he did the job. And he said, I lay there that night thinking of all that he had done for me. And he said, while I was sleeping, God spoke to my heart and said, hey, Charlie, do you remember who packed your chute? And what God was saying, it was not just the man who physically helped him pack that chute, but those in his spiritual life who had helped him. He said, I thought about my mom who had pointed me to Jesus Christ and led me to Christ. He said, I thought about my high school coach who I, I was wayward from God and I was going the wrong way, but he got a hold of me and brought me back to Christ. He talked about a sergeant in the military that got him going the right direction. He said, yes, God, I, a lot of people have packed my chute. He said, as I... And I thought about that as I read that story this week. I thought about people that's packed my shoe. I thought about my mom. Beautiful southern woman from Tennessee and sweetheart of a lady. And thought about my dad, a Baptist preacher, and how he taught me great theology. My mom taught me, he taught me theology. My mom taught me neology. Amen. They packed my shoe. I thought of one of the greatest Christians I've ever met in my life. And that, was my, that is my wife. Raised nine children and nurtured them in the Lord. And I'd be out working and trying to make ends meet or preaching somewhere or serving God and not one time complain. Hey, why don't you stay home? Why do you got to go out and do all that? Serve God and been faithful to God. I thought of people that have packed my shoe and helped me through the years. And as I thought about them, Brother Dan, I was having a weary week. It was like David there. He'd win many battles and... Maybe a little faint. But Brother Perry, I said, I can't throw in the towel. Hey, it's not time to go wobbly. It's time to step up to the plate. It's time to do something for God. Hey, the country's never been in worse shape than it is now. This economy is the way it is, and our families are being destroyed. I'm saying today, every young person, it's time to step up for Jesus Christ. It's no time to go wobbly.